this St. Patrick's Day. We're glad that all of you could join us today. I'm Janine Birchie Johnson, and one of my roles at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary is as alumni director. And I want to welcome all the alumni who've joined us today and those who will listen to this later. Just a couple of housekeeping uh, details before we get started. If you have any technical concerns throughout the webinar, just um, send a chat message to the AMBS host. And I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat and make sure you uh, send that to everyone, not just to the panelists. Um, say your name, where you are now, and what years you were at AMBS. As we go through um, the questions that we have prepared ahead of time, if you have questions you would like to ask, please put those in the Q&A function or feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. I'll be watching those questions and comments, and I will select the ones that I'll ask Daniel later. Please note that this webinar, including questions, is being recorded. Turning now to our conversation, Daniel Grimes is Vice President for Advancement and Enrollment. Before coming to AMBS in 2015, Daniel worked in the healthcare and insurance industries. He's worked for the Pennsylvania Department of Health, Blue Cross and Blue Shield affiliates, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and Friesenius Medical Care, he also worked at Everance, formerly MMA, for 19 years in provider relations and group health sales. Daniel has served as an adjunct professor at Indiana Tech and has served on the boards of Mennonite Health Services Alliance, Everance Financial Credit Union, and Mennonite Central Committee Great Lakes. He's also a former elected official, and for eight years, he was a member of the Goshen City Council. Daniel will start by answering several questions I have for him, and after that, we'll have time for your questions and comments. Welcome, Daniel. Invite you to first just tell us whatever you'd like us to know about yourself. Sorry about that. I'm going to start out by uh, saying that I'm West Philly, born and raised. Um, and that my family has been Mennonite for three generations. And the reason why that is significant is that I believe pretty strongly that place uh, is important in your formation and who you are. Um, so I'm you know, from Philadelphia originally, um, which I often tell people is where the, the city uh, where America began. So that's, that's my hometown. Um, and my family has been Mennonite for several generations. Um, and I think that's important because as formation, um, sort of like where your, what your parents view of the Bible and God is very significant in your formation and how you navigate the world. And so my story is simply that it's my life story, um, which is likely very different than anyone else on the Zoom um, call or Zoom meeting this afternoon. Um, other things about myself, um, I said, you know, family of origin plays a vital role. I'm from a very socially and politically active and aware family. So that was uh, important in my formation. And I'm also, uh, our family unit is also very much Mennonite education boosters. My wife and I are both graduates of Eastern Mennonite College. Um, it was just a college where we went there back in the seventies and we are, uh, the parents of four adult children, each of whom is a graduate of Goshen College. Uh, three of our children are married. One is in a pretty serious relationship and all their spouses or partners are also graduates of Mennonite higher ed with the exception of one um, who is a graduate of Temple University in Philadelphia, which is where my, I uh, did my master's work at Temple University. So for those of you who are on the call maybe from back east, recognize that Temple Owls are everywhere. So I'll just have to throw in that little plug there. Um, like I said, our children are all married. Uh, three of them live in Indianapolis um, in close proximity. They all have different career tracks. One's an um, urban uh, educator uh, in gardening. One is an accountant. The other is a mechanical engineer. And then our youngest daughter lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, so those who are affiliated with Christopher Dock or Lancaster Mennonite probably have seen uh, her work at some of her music productions. 
Um, we also have one granddaughter. Um, hopefully there'll be more that will be coming, but at this juncture, we have one. Um, and Zunane mentioned that uh, a little bit about my professional background before coming, to M uh, coming here to AMBS seven years ago, but I also just wanna point out that I do not have a seminary degree, but when I was at EMC, I was a double major in nursing and biblical theology. So I do have some background in theology. And even though I've spent most of my career in healthcare and insurance, I've always had an interest in studying the Bible and in, and in theology. Thank you, Daniel. There may be more questions from folks later about some of those parts of your story. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a story about a time when you experienced God in a powerful way. Okay, well, I don't wanna go into uh, any specific details about stories in this particular venue, but I will say that I've experienced God in very powerful ways several times throughout my life. And I would classify that really more as God whispers. Um, and that would be, um, you know, the strong sense of direction from God. And sometimes that's been an actually from, in my experience, in an audible way, directly from God or through others. Um, and I'll just say that I, I consider myself, I'm, I'm a pretty intense person. Um, I like to operate with a full plate. So I'm always processing, evaluating and planning things. And that's, that's just who I am by nature. Um, and I also hate to lose. Um, and I like to do things well and do the right thing. So that being said, fits into um, how I have experienced God in ways that when there are decisions that need to be made, whether or not there are college choices, uh, career issues, or even relationship issues, I've never shied away from praying about those things and asking God for direction. Um, and that's been received. So whether or not it's um, going back, you know, as far as some college choices, um, and sometimes that's not even listening to the voice of God of things that are just obeying things that maybe you even disagree with. Um, and I will say that in, in some college choices, when to go off to college, um, if I had listened to that voice, um, the small, the robbery that occurred at our small fa family uh, business in Philadelphia would have likely had a very different and tragic outcome if I had not been present during that particular robbery. Um, I would not have, actually my wife and I would not be married. Um, uh, if it wasn't for that strong sense and actually an audible voice of God telling us about our relationship and or the same thing about even coming to Indiana. Um, for a season, our family was uh, brethren in Christ when we lived in Harrisburg. And so we resubscribed to the Gospel Herald. That's what it was called at that juncture. Um, and the first edition, there's an ad for this position at Mennonite Mutual Aid that is exactly the same job title. I had when I worked for Blue Cross and Blue Shield organization. Um, so it was sort of just felt like a direct calling that the church needed someone with this really detailed, specific uh, job experience that was calling. Um, so we felt like that was direct hand of God in, informing us um, about what, what direction or what path to take. So I, I guess in short, I would sort of sum it up to some extent um, that looking or feeling the presence, strong presence of God as a director. You know, it's sort of like when there are choices for God to speak into it and to say, this is the path to go, and this is the way I prepared for you. Thank you. That might lead right into the next question, which is what attracted you to be part of the AMBS community? Yeah, well, um, I'll start by just saying when I was a small child, um, my first desire for a career was to actually be a judge. Um, something about on a man in black robes, you know, the wisdom of Solomon. But when I told that to my parents, I was informed that to be a judge, you had to be a lawyer and lawyers lie. So that's off the table. Um, so, <laughs> so I gave up the lawyer part and um, wanted to actually go into education. So for most of my life, I was interested in education, but in the seventies, a lot of the persons that I, um, knew that had majored in education in college were actually ended up pumping gas um, and did not land decent um, teaching uh, jobs after their four years of college. So I was determined that after four years of college, I wanted a stable and secure uh, job field, which is why I, why I chose nursing and, and then added biblical theology on top of that with that. 
Um, that be, also being said, when I was at EMC, I actually worked in the admissions department. So I had like the plum, you know, work study job. It was great and was actually offered a position to stay on as an employee after graduation, um, but turned that down. I've also done some, as Janine mentioned, some adjunct teaching at a local um, university here as well. So I've always had an interest in that. Um, but um, I saw actually the ad for the position I took initially, which was director of enrollment and financial aid. It was actually just a posting in our church newsletter. Um, and when I saw that, you know, there were just so many things that sort of uh, went off for me. It's about, well, here's maybe my chance, you know, um, when you're, if you're going to make a career change, it's better to do that when you're 50 something than when you're 60 something. Um, and so here was my chance to work in an educational institution using a lot of the gifts. Um, and then even the financial aid side, I would consider myself somewhat of a numbers person, a budget person. For instance, a lot of the nonprofits I've, I've been on the board of, I'm always generally on the finance committee. Um, so there were just a lot of features about the job that I felt to be quite attractive. So um, I couldn't pass it up, so I applied. And here I am, seven years later, ending my professional work career um, at an educational institution focusing on theology. Wonderful. Um, you have a role that encompasses two branches of the AMBS community, enrollment and advancement. And I'm wondering if you could tell us what some of the projects that you're working on right now this year have been. It doesn't have to be right now, but earlier this year. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've been um, working on and who else is involved in those? Um, just give us a, a picture of your work life. Yeah, okay. Well, we're very busy on lots of fronts, on the development side and the admissions side, just two very um, busy departments in the institution that are both very important in their, their own way. And there's a lot of, I would say, a lot of uh, interplay between the two. Uh, one thing, particularly in the development side, what we did this year, um, we promoted our senior um, development director, Bob Yoder, to the director of the department. Um, so put a director over that department. And Bob's done a really good job as far as leading that department and onboarding two new hires this past year. So uh, two of the new development associates only came on board this past year and that onboarding has gone extremely well. So we're really pleased with that. Um, there also has been a lot of work gearing up you know, for new and exciting fundraising initiatives that will allow us to just sort of position AMBS for the future and to better serve the church. So there's a lot of work going into new initiatives um, that will obviously need funding. So a lot of, lot of exciting things going on in programming here at AMBS. Um, there's also, many of you have probably received some letters this year asking you to contribute to either established endowed scholarships or newly established endowed scholarships. So um, if you haven't received any of those letters, you know, let us know. We'll be happy to clue you in on ways that you can help support those endowment, those endowed funds, which actually go a long way toward helping to support the financial aid that we're able to offer to students. So there's been a lot of activity and work, very successful work on that um, over this past year. And then COVID uh, impacted both departments and particularly in the development areas, we had to find new ways of connecting with our donors um, and not being able to do face-to-face -face for most of the year. Um, however, with the COVID surge waning at this juncture, we've been able to sort of jumpstart that the ability to meet with donors face to face again. And that has going very well. So we're back up to, to some degree close to where we were prior to the pandemic with having face to face meetings with individuals. We're also redoing some of our literature and things of that nature, um, just trying to and also sort of connect it with the um, update of our website as well, you know, making take away pieces and leave behind literature sort of coincide with some of the new information on the web, website. And in the admissions area, it's really been, um, right now is actually peak season for admissions because this is the week that actually the merit scholarship deadlines occur. And then we have some other deadlines are fastly approaching. And it's sort of like the juncture where 
actually this week, even just yesterday, I was on a exec meeting with the executive committee of the board and I actually didn't know what my numbers were looking like as far as students for next year because you know they're coming in that that rapidly and even you know 10 30 I'm getting it notices from someone else that just new application review things of that nature so things are just really really busy in a, in a positive way so that's good um we've also in the last year in the financial aid area have restructured some of our financial aid we now provide uh, church matching funds um, up to $1,000 a per semester for, for students, uh, which is uh, double that for most other Mennonite higher ed institutions. We also instituted several new scholarship programs that are designed primarily um, to help us with our strategic objective of having the AMBS uh, student community be more reflective of the overall uh, Mennonite church population in North America overall. Um, so we're, and we're finding new ways to reach out to prospective students um, and doing a lot more uh, emailing and texting and things of that nature and moving actually toward a more church, what I would classify as a church relations um, mode of recruitment. Um, so we recognize that AMBS doesn't necessarily call individuals into ministry. That's what congregations do. And we look, walk alongside those congregations and educating um, those persons called. So we've been doing a lot of fostering relationships with congregations and key church leaders um, and that display the full racial and ethnic diversity of the church. And even some of our communication pieces have been translated into Spanish this year for the first time, um, doing some communication in Spanish. We're also planning several new um, a new initiative to generate videos. So as another way of communicating with congregations and conferences about um, AMBS and giving some profiles on students and, and not shying away from maybe some of the challenges that uh, diverse types of students um, from various backgrounds and settings and programs have encountered and how we walk alongside them to make their seminary journey um, successful. We also um, want to partner with Mennonite higher education institutions to develop stronger relationships, working with them to maybe augment their programs and to provide um, sort of an entry point for students uh, to consider seminary study. Um, and I've actually just recently submitted a grant request um, to the Showalter Foundation for funds that would allow us to offer what we're calling a Mennonite Educator Summit here on our campus next fall. So hopefully that will um, come through. And then just lastly, I guess one thing, sort of an unexpected thing is that we have quite a few international students. And I think some of the other third Thursdays we've talked about that some students here on campus. Um, and unfortunately, several of our international students this year have had firsthand experience with the American healthcare system, um, including all of its flaws. Um, and so I've had to work on several issues relating to some claim resolution and are in the active process of looking looking for an alternative healthcare solution for international students. So there's a lot of activities of development we're uh, going on in both departments of development and admissions. Um, we're you know really hands-on um, because our work is dealing with individuals. Um, so it takes a lot of a lot of time and but a lot, lot of good a lot of good conversation and, and ability to um, interface with various aspects of the church. I'm wondering if you could share with us a dream or two that you have for AMBS. Okay, hey, well, I would say, you know, I mentioned earlier that I, you know, somewhat consider myself somewhat of a numbers, numbers person. So uh, from my vantage point, you know, I'm always concerned about numbers and growth and how that fits into um, the bigger scheme of things. However, for us at, at AMBS, we really want numbers to grow naturally. Um, and for numbers to grow at a natural pace, whether or not they're financial contributions or students or persons just receiving services here, you know, we have to demonstrate um, our value to the church overall. So I guess my hope or dream would be that, that uh, the church would see us as an attractive uh, institution that belongs to the church. Um, and we're here to serve the church. Um, so it will take us and a lot of the things that we're doing currently or a lot of things, we, initiatives we have in, in the works are sort of geared toward um, 
increasing that the value that people see in us, you know, whether those are doing things such as creating resources for church vitality and supporting pastors um, or just access to theological education uh, through an Anabaptist lens, which only can occur um, through the generosity of our donors. So we are very affordable um, in comparison to other seminaries and very few of our seminary students have uh, any debt at this point, which is a significant turnaround. So another hope would be that people would see us so valuable that those funding sources would continue to come in and increase so that theological education can um, continue to expand to be even more accessible to the broader church in all of its um, rich uh, ethnic and racial diversity that everyone would see AMBS as a resource for them. Um, so those are some of the things I would hope for, you know, as far as that, that people sort of maybe, I don't know, I'm from Lancaster Conference originally, and, you know, Lancaster Conference, at least back in the day, you know, people had this allegiance to church institutions, and that was just, that was your go-to. So I guess my dream would be that, that we would be able to demonstrate to the broader church um, that we are the go-to institution um, to support the churches in, in, in God's reconciling mission in the world and to provide support and resources so that individual congregations can go about fulfilling their mission in an effective way in their local locales. Thanks, those are wonderful dreams. Um, and before we turn to other questions that our um, alums who have joined us today want to ask, um, I'll ask if you have any questions for them. Is there anything you'd like to know uh, from those who have joined us today? Yeah, good question. Well, I mentioned earlier that I like to succeed and I like to do things well. So I guess I would I would I would value some honest feedback from this this constituent group, some critique about how we're doing. Um, and I would I guess I would say in, in three different areas. You know, one would be how how have you experienced AMBS over the last 12 to 18 months? You know, have we communicated with you at an appropriate rate? Do you feel like you've received information that's been helpful? Um, or what, what things are missing that you wish you knew about AMBS or received that you don't have? Number two, I'd be very curious in how alumni view uh, the whole, whole concept of people being called into ministry vocations. Is that something that you feel is part of your responsibility or where would you see that, that responsibility, um, where would that be housed at? Um, and what advice would you have to offer to us of how we can do a better job of connecting with those who have been called to ministry? Um, and then thirdly, um, I would ask, or just be curious if anybody, how many, how many persons on the call have, have actually read through or at least thumbed through our annual report? Um, and if you did, were you aware, were there any surprising things that, that jumped out to you or were you aware of these, the small percentage of revenue that actually comes from student tuition and how dependent we are upon um, endowed funds and gifts uh, to support the seminary? And if you are, you know, does that, how does that change your thinking and does it motivate you to play it forward, um, whether or not that's in um, donating to AMBS or increasing your donations to AMBS or including us in your estate plan, those kind of things. Just what kind of impact when you read through the annual report does that make to you? So, you know, the question would be, how can we do better and how are we communicating with you in effective and maybe ineffective ways? Great questions. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, I now invite those of you who've joined us today to ask your questions. And you can use the Q&A feature. Um, if you prefer just to answer the question that Daniel has asked, you can do that in the chat. But it's also fine if you want to use those as a question. Uh, I'll be watching both the chat and the Q&A. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Daniel, I'm going to go back to your story of being on the Goshen City Council. I don't remember how many years that was. But um, how did that experience shape you? And what tools did that give you for your work today in the, in the roles that you have at AMBS? 
a great question. When I was on Goshen City Council for eight years um, at the beginning, from 2000, beginning in 2000 to 2008. Um, and it was a very rewarding experience. I, I should back up and say, I did not um, seek out necessarily to run for city council. Um, it, was, it was not something to say, okay, I wanna be a politician. It actually just grew out of my natural involvement in my new community. So I was very, when I moved to Goshen in 1994, Four. We, I was just very involved in a lot of local initiatives. And there were some, I won't go into detail, some things occurring in the community that I didn't understand. And as a newcomer, I kind of questioned my colleagues at, at, at MMA and my neighbors, like, I don't understand this. Why is this happening this way? And people would tell me, well, that's just the way things are. You know, they're the elected officials. They do, they just do things. And I, I told people, well, I moved from Pennsylvania, but I'm still in an America. And in America, the people decide. Um, and so I became active and I did some, uh, took it upon myself to develop a, uh, a petition and that I took around, knocked on doors. Um, and I enjoyed that community engagement. And so we, long story short, there was a school initiative that, that ended up being uh, canceled and rebooted in a completely different fashion that ended up saving our community about $13 million at the time. Um, and when I went public with this, I, I my phone kept ringing off the hook. There were other people who were wanted to get actively involved and how could they help? Um, and so I was just asked by uh, the local minority party in our county to run for city council with the expectation that they just needed somebody on the, on the ticket. There was no expectation that I would actually win because the district that I um, was running in had never elected someone from my party in over 50 years. So it was like really basically a no-win situation, but I campaigned hard. Um, like I said, I like to do things well. I knocked on every door. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, part of that, you know, you do your own fundraising, you know, so you just sort of learn skills. What, what do I need to do to get this job done? Um, one thing else I'll just throw this might as a, maybe a side note that you will might find in, of interest. Um, at the time I ran for council, there literally may have been 30 African-Americans in the entire city of Goshen, 25,000 at the time, maybe. Um, and I heard from a colleague who was at a barbershop and there were some in gentlemen in the barbershop talking about that Grimes guy. Um, and, you know, I think he's done a lot of really good things, but you know, you know about him, don't you? And the guy was listening, my friend was listening, thinking they were going to mention that he was African-American. Um, he said, you know, he's Mennonite. Um, and so, that was viewed as a negative um, because it was sort of like the the implication of Mennonites taking over too many positions. So I'll just throw that as an interesting side note about um, how you're viewed in society and necessarily sort of like um, not conforming to uh, generally norms of other people, sticking out a little bit. But I would say, you know, the thing for me with, with city council, and there were, there were times when I was on council that I took very unpopular um, votes um, for things because, um, and I was actually told by some council members, you know, if you vote that way, even though everybody thought it was the right way to vote, you're gonna lose votes. And so it's like, well, that's not important. I'm not on council just to be on council. If I can't do good, um, I don't need this job. Um, and I had a life before I was on council and I'll have a life when I'm off council. So I'm gonna do the right thing, even if it costs me votes. And it, and it did, it likely did cost me votes. Um, so I think some of the things that I learned, you know, as far as some fundraising techniques, um, just hone in on your public speaking skills um, and sales. I've been in sales for most of my life in, in, in uh, the health industry. And so I think that bringing those kind of skill sets assisted me, I think, in making a transition uh, for some of the work that I do here at AMBS as well. Um, so I think there were a lot of uh, learnings, learnings there as well that just easily transfer over to things that I feel comfortable with that are just sort of, I sort of gravitate towards it that way. I don't know if that gets to your question. There. Yeah, that's great. And I'm going to push just a little bit further in one area. I'm wondering how um, working in a city council that's, that has been fairly evenly divided between the, the political parties you had to listen carefully to a lot of different perspectives and find ways of cooperating with each other. Um, how do you see that um, serving you in your AMBS roles? 
Well, I think part of that is just trying to um, understand things from someone else's perspective. I will say one thing, another formational thing for me, when I was in high school, I was the uh, co-captain of our debate club. Um, I know it sounds nerdy, but debate club was the most fun ever. I loved it. And we were actually league champions that year, um, my senior year. So you, when you're in debate, you always have to make the case from both sides um, and understand things that way. And I think that's part of it. I will say even like some of my city council experience, I mean, there were times, you know, for instance, there was a anti-smoking ordinance that, you know, wanted to come. We did pass. And some persons, you know, um, would say, well, you know, I don't care if other people don't like it. You guys have the votes, just do it. And that was really not my perspective, um, that I didn't feel it was incumbent upon me to force my will on others, um, that there needs to be a clear uh, negotiations, there needs to be clear communication, and is there a way to meet uh, in the middle to some degree so that neither party feels that their rights have been totally uh, snuffed out, and then you can bring that person along to further on your continuum as you progress. Um, but you have to have some kind of place to start to dance. Um, and so I think those kind of things help when you're even talking to prospective students per se about, you know, where is, you know, where are we starting at this dance and, and what are the things that they're concerned about to try to be able to communicate in such a way that they understand you know, you have a clearer understanding of what their perspective is, and you can communicate in ways to hope, hopefully overcome some of those reservations that people have, uh, whether or not that's a prospective student or prospective donor, but to really understand where a person is coming from. And to respect that. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question from Elizabeth Soto. Thank you. Um, she is commenting that there are many small churches now, both inner city and even in rural areas that can't afford um, full-time support of pastors or offering full benefits. And she's wondering if AMBS is doing anything to promote bivocation um, approaches to pastoral formation. Um, so I'll leave that question. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. Yeah, I, I would say I know that has been a part of the conversation or dialogue here at AMBS for quite some time. And actually, prior to my tenure here, there had been some gatherings talking about bivocational and how we can um, support recognizing that reality. Um, I would say here is from the role that I play here at, at AMBS, we have um, scholarships that are specifically for bivocational pastors, and we've designed um, some of our academic programs are more geared toward um, individuals who are bivocational. And that would be, you know, whether or not it's online degree programs, which have actually increased, you know, even more in the recent uh, time period as well. So there's more of that kind of work occurring and, and more of, like I said, as far as scholarships um, for part-time students um, and not just full-time students, for students that cannot come to campus to study that needs to stay in their place of location um, because they're working there and just really cannot uproot um, and move here. So there is really conversation talk about recognizing that reality, that churches um, will have a harder time as, as the average congregation size um, becomes smaller and smaller. Um, it's more of a luxury of those larger churches who can afford a full-time full -time pastor or multi-pastoral uh, staff. So I think that's the ways we're working at that. Um, it's a, it's a long-term issue. And I think some of it even has to do with how people view ministry per se. Um, and so some of that, you know, being the tent maker type concept and how, how that can play in um, to making sure that, that there are appropriate church leaders going forward. Thank you. Others, please share your questions in the Q&A. Daniel, I'll ask you to reflect a little bit about um, how you have worked with AMBS's uh, long-term planning, its goals. Um, you mentioned that you like numbers. And um, I know that one of the things you've worked really hard at is to quantify 
whether we're reaching some of those goals that we've set, our strategic plans. Do you want to comment on your role in helping to shape the strategic plans and also to implement it? Sure. Well, I would say the one thing that historically, as far as development, there's always been targets established as far as fundraising goals, because you have to balance the budget and how many funds need to come in. So that's that's something that has more of a longstanding history and precedent. That wasn't necessarily the same case, I would say, in the, in the admission side. Um, and so during my tenure here, I mean, we worked at that. We have a new strategic plan that was just implemented. It's a five-year plan. Um, that will go through 2025. And part of that is not just as far as what type of uh, headcount and students we should have, but for my work here, I wasn't really clear on how some of those things were established. So, you know, did a lot of work on doing some analysis, data analysis on historical figures. So how can I go, how can I project forward what a reasonable um, student count is if I don't really have a good take on the prior history and why. Some explanations for what those numbers, the fluctuation in numbers were like. So I did quite a bit of analysis on that to come up with um, metrics and analysis going back five-year trends or seven-year trends or even further to identify that. So that's sort of how we have, have started to work at that so we can establish realistic goals. And I will just say some other places that I have worked actually um, sort of pressing some of the VPs, some things were actually done by DART. So I'm not a DART board, find out the number, but I've worked places where that's where we did. So that doesn't feel comfortable to me. And it's sort of think about, you have to understand numbers, that numbers I always tell people that a number is, is actually meaningless when it stands by itself. Numbers only have meaning or value in comparison to other numbers. So it's all about those trends. So, um, you know, for instance, when I worked for Blue Cross, one of my roles was um, account reporting and consulting. And so we, we did a lot of data analysis. So I'm familiar with the, that data analysis process, which I think is very helpful in helping you establish realistic goals. The other thing, it's not just about the numbers, but it's digging down deeper into those numbers. And so one of the new strategic objectives is really that our student body be more reflective of the rich racial and ethnic diversity of the church in North America. So we have used financial aid to um, assist us in our enrollment process. So that's why there are several new scholarships that were implemented last year that are really targeted towards specific groups and why we have made some efforts to reach out to different constituent groups um, in ways that are comfortable to, for them to, to establish those relationships. For instance, um, the Hispanic Mennonite Council recently had a, a gathering and we had a representative you know, um, I previously went to a gathering of people of color, known people of color gathering where, you know, people were saying, we don't know ABS, we don't have a relationship with them. So we are actively um, trying to identify and connect with those influencers and individuals in the church so that we are known to the church and people have a clearer understanding of the value add that AMBS can deliver to their congregations. Thanks. And that brings up uh, another question um, related to employment at AMBS. You just recently joined a brand new task force um, to look at how our employee makeup might better represent the diversity of the church as well. Do you have any comments? I know you're just getting going here, but are there at least tell, tell our alums about what the hopes and goals are for that group? Yeah, thank you. And that, actually, that meeting was started too. It'll be my first time participating in that that group gathering. Um, so there's a little bit of work I need to do on my lunch break here. But um, that group is really looking once again. It's looking at the numbers. So you know, you people, not just anecdotal information, but what what do the numbers tell us? How? So there's been some work in our human resource department to look at not only our current employee base, but as far as the hiring practices and what kind of uh, applicants have come through when vacancies have occurred. And then also talk about, you know, how significant is representation um, in our employee base. Um, so those are things that we're going to have to wrestle with. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? Um, and I guess adding to that component, it's not just in this regard, it's not just the numbers present, but I always look at things as, as you know, there's a short-term objective and a long-term objective. And I've taken that approach to, you know, my uh, professional 
career as well, that the short term, yes, you may want a more diverse work group, but you also have to ask the question, what am I doing to develop uh, the potential it, the potential individuals out there who may who currently may not know us or may not qualify for those jobs. So it's not just about increasing those numbers today, but to me, what am I doing to develop a diverse work group for tomorrow? So that's something I will definitely push for, and that needs to be incorporated into how we go about uh, establishing programs and funding mechanisms so that we're actually increasing the number in the pipeline instead of just taking from it. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the alums? I'm gonna ask that again, because this is your chance. You can put that in the Q&A feature right at the bottom of your screen. Daniel, while we're waiting for another question from them, I'll ask you um, about your free time, what are the things that you enjoy doing when you're not crunching the numbers at work? And I know you you sometimes stay at work pretty late. So how do you relax? What do you enjoy? Um, well, my wife would say uh, the other woman is the garden. Um, so it's not, it's not unusual for me to come home, kiss the wife and walk outside and, and meander around the garden to see how things have changed from yesterday. Um, so I've always, my philosophy has always been, if you can't play in the dirt, what's the point? Um, so that's, that's something that is, uh, something I'm really, I really enjoy. And, and actually a little surprise with growing, you know, having four children, you try to get them to cooperate in the garden and do all kinds of tasks and, you know, they complain, they're kids. Um, but my daughter is, is really a garden educator, um, and it's established urban gardening uh, programs in Pittsburgh and in Chicago. Um, so it's just kind of interesting the things that they sort of observe and, and, and take the heart that you kind of surprised by. Um, so that's one thing I do. Um, I do like the exercise. I have a treadmill in my basement. I, I um, uh, kill two birds with one stone, as you could say. I, um, I'm a news junkie, at least my wife would classify me that way. So when I'm on my treadmill, um, I get my news fix from the shows that I've taped so I can fast forward through all the commercials and get my exercise and my news fix at the same time. And then I do like to watch sporting events, particularly professional football. I like the football season. I'm, I'm always glued to the TV on Sunday afternoons. So um, enjoy that. I'm hoping um, starting next year to um, read more. Um, that's a big goal for myself. Uh, I'd like, um, and I was just telling someone, I was at the, a, um, lecture series at Notre Dame earlier this week um, and just fascinated by new new reads but I, I generally I don't I think it's probably been 20 years since I've read a novel um, I generally read uh, biographies or just some kind of up and coming topical matter so and I you know I enjoy we hope to do more traveling I like to travel um, I have been to all 48 lower States. I haven't been to Alaska in a while, so that's on my bucket list. But um, like to travel and, and uh, obviously connect with our our children in their dispersed locations. Well, and hopefully you'll uh, get to spend a lot of time with those grandchildren, right? <laughs> yeah, the one for now. We're hoping for more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I um, I think we have not had any other questions come in. So we're going to bring this to an end here. I want to thank you, Daniel, for um, answering these questions, giving us an insight into the work that you do. And we're so grateful for all the coordinating that you do at AMBS. I want to thank our alums for your ongoing support of AMBS. Um, you don't realize how much that means to us. The fact that many of our students come to us because someone has uh, tap them on the shoulder, and often that has been um, someone who knows AMBS through personal experience. So continue to do that. Continue to call people out in your congregation who might be leaders. We have so many opportunities now, as Daniel was saying, to walk alongside and educate them while they're serving in their own setting. Uh, the majority of our, or the, 
yeah, it's we're now above 50% of our MDiv uh, program participants are in the MDiv Connect program. Also, thank you for your donations to AMBS for influencing other people to share their financial resources with AMBS. If you um, have any interest in taking a course, uh, auditing a course with your alumni credit, please let me know. Um, we can hook you up with that as well. Um, and then also you can stay connected to the seminary through the Church Leadership Center offerings. We had a wonderful Pastors and Leaders event here just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we look forward to the short courses and other things that are happening in the coming months. Thank you also to our student, Janet McGeary, who provided technical support for this web. Uh, next month, we will be talking with Alan Rudy Froze, who is the professor of proclamation preaching. And then in May, we will be meeting with uh, Rachel Miller Jacobs, who is professor of Christian formation. So thank you so much for being here today. And we hope to see you again next month. Farewell. Thanks.